<laughs> that I wasn't recording yet. Okay. So this is uh, polystyrene. Um, okay, it's one of the lobotomy, or you can also do plasma. Um, where is it? Um, it's not mentioned here, but uh, plasmapheresis is an option, meaning we will um, uh, selectively remove red blood cells and then return the rest to you. Okay, uh, but the easiest and most, uh, the cheapest way to treat it are phlebotomies. So you have an attack, you have the symptoms, you come to the hospital, they'll take your blood 350 to 500 ml each time every other day until your hematocrit is less than 45 percent okay so um i know this says weekly but uh, it can be removed um, every other day also but your textbook says weekly so let's stick with that uh, but again your uh, indication when to stop is if your hematocrit is now less than 45 percent meaning you're back to normal then you can go home however this procedure will do what? Because we're not technically just removing the cells, we're remo removing along with everything else. So you may develop iron deficiency anemia in the process. So the phlebotomy, as stated here on the next statement, only removes red blood cells mostly. But what happens in with the WBCs or platelets? This is where the chemo agent hydroxyurea now comes in. So there is no IV chemotherapy here. We'll use oral hydroxyurea just to decrease um, red, uh, red blood cell production in the bone marrow. Then radiation therapy is also another option. And this will be a lifelong thing. All right, so you manage these all throughout your life for however long that is. Uh, meanwhile, in between, when you're at home, stay hydrated. We want to make sure your blood isn't very viscous. So um, where is that? Here, I drink at least three uh, liters a day. And uh, because again, circulation is a problem here because of hyperviscosity, avoid tight clothing, no crossing your legs, elevate feet at rest to promote circulation. Um, and then report chest pain because this could be signs of clotting. That clot could be a heart attack or even a stroke. Uh, complications are related to the clotting episodes that may uh, um, develop. Um, MI or stroke are some of the major complications of polycythemia. And that's about it. So as you can see, we have symptoms of anemia here, along with hypertension. So signs and symptoms of anemia and signs and symptoms of hypertension, along with the uh, splenomegaly, and or a hepatomegaly also and then always watch out for the complications such as uh, signs and symptoms of a mi or stroke questions now we're good all righty let's go straight to this is page 694 Okay, so let's go to 702. Lymphomas. Uh, this is very short. So what are lymphomas? There are two. We have Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. This is actually part of cancer, but we never got to this for exam two. Um, so what happens here? Thank you for reading. Uh, let's go to the pathophysiology here. Uh, Ms. Poveda. 
Malignant lymphomas evolve from a single progenitor or stem or stem cell in a lymph node that develops into a solid tumor or mass as a cancer. All right, so put simply, what are lymphomas? In the root word lymph, so what are these, where did these tumors come from? Lymph nodes. From a lymph node. Okay, so this is a cancerous lymph node that grows into a tumor or a mass. Where do we find lymph nodes? In your armpits, in your throat. Okay, uh, so we have the them around the neck, right? Uh, in the armpit, the neck. Most of them, though, are inside our chest cavity. Mm -hmm. So when you have a tumor growing inside your chest cavity, in within the rib cage. We only have two organs in there. We have the lungs and the heart. All right. So when these things grow, what will be your problems? Obstruction. Hey, will you have shortness of breath? Breathing. Yes. Breathing. Yeah. Mostly breathing problems. And then, of course, that will lead to also low cardiac output when the, when the mass or the tumor presses on either the lungs or the heart, or sometimes not directly on the heart. So if it's on the right side, it may press on the superior vena cava or the inferior vena cava, or both. Between the two, we have Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's. Which one is worse? Let's go up here for you to answer the question. Okay, here. So between Hodgkin's and Non-Hodgkins, if you read the description, which one would you rather have if you have to pick one? Non-Hodgkins. Hodgkins. Uh, Christy said she'd prefer non-Hodgkins. <laughs> That's what you said, I right? Hodgkins. Okay, all right. So Hodgkins are um, more receptive to treatment. Non-Hodgkins, though, not only do they grow really fast, they're more aggressive. Um, there is very little treatment for non-Hodgkin's. I mean, we used to, this is cancer, so we still treat it with chemo, radiation, and even surgery. Um, but the chances of survival, it's um, higher in Hodgkin's lymphoma. Manifestations, what are they? Really depends on the stage, okay? Um, here, manifestations don't really appear until the disease is already advanced, okay? So by the time you get really, you really get diagnosed with uh, lymphoma, I mean, the, 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 the tumor has already spread pretty much, okay? So again, the um, manifestations uh, always start local. So you have these lumps uh, appearing in your neck, underarm, and groin. So these are the, where your lymph nodes obviously are located. They become enlarged. And then once we do that, the doctor will probably send you for a CAT scan to see if there are tumors growing on the rest of the lymph nodes, which again, most of them are within the thoracic cavity. Here is your, so I mentioned the CAT scan, uh, if needed, PET scan, because these are, especially the non-Hodgkins, are metastatic, so they can spread to other body systems as well. Uh, management, we already finished cancer, so they are chemo, radiation, and surgery. So here we have um, chemo and radiation, and then, oh, uh, transplantation also, stem cell transplantation is also another option. And then here's surgery. We literally remove the, the overgrown tumors and complications. Remember oncologic emergencies? Yes, no, maybe? Yes. Okay, so here, if you remember them, 
um, the SVC syndrome, spinal cord compression, hypercalcemia, are due to lymphoma. So one, two, three of those, um, I think we had eight oncologic emergency. So yeah. three of them are from lymphomas. So we already did this in cancer and because they're mentioned again in lymphomas, will they be on the test? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Your favorite. To summarize your signs and symptoms, again, when the symptoms occur, where is the stage of the disease already? In the is it still in the early? No. No. No more. Okay, so it has already most likely spread by the time we um, we discover or make the diagnosis. And your manifestations we did the assessment manifest i mean interventions rather sorry interventions will be um, related to um, not only the disease which is you administer chemo um, watch them for complications of radiation and then uh, surgery pre and post-op at the same time you have to watch for those oncologic emergencies Any questions? The blood transfusion here, this one of course is a result of the treatment regimen because you, uh, let's say you give chemo, right? So that will cause bone marrow suppression. So now you have anemia, thrombocytopenia, and um, neutropenia. And because you have neutropenia, so now you have risk for infection. Again, no different from what we discussed in cancer because Lymphomas are a form of cancer. Questions? Last topic is can uh, liver. Page thirteen hundred, chapter fifty nine. Let's start with hepatitis first. Uh, you want to do hepatitis or cirrhosis first? Um, All right, let's hepatitis. do hepatitis. Okay, hepatitis, we have a uh, viral hepatitis. Hepatitis can also occur from bacteria. It can also occur from uh, drugs, but the hepatitis that is mentioned here are from your uh, viral hepatitis. So we have hepatitis A, B, C, D, and E. Select all that apply. <laughs> all right, so I mentioned uh, drugs can, I mean, drugs can induce hepatitis. So these are the drugs that cause it. And then we also have toxins that can result in hepatitis. Um, whether it's uh, drug induced or caused by a virus, manifestations are the same. However, the management, although similar, will, will differ as far as infection control or controlling the transmission. So that's where the questions on the exam come in. It will be to prevent transmission so you have to know how is each type of viral hepatitis uh, transmitted. So you need to know modes of transmission for each one. Um, oh, there, there are um, F and G hepatitis now, but for our purpose, we will only test up to E, A, B, C, D, and E, because those are the most frequent ones. Manifestations, like I already said, are the same. So if your liver is inflamed, these are the manifestations. First is you'll have severe malay. Okay, you'll be tired, you'll have no energy, you feel sick. You'll have abdominal pain, you're irritable, uh, itching, 
um, jaundice, then the, the GI symptoms, nausea, vomiting, you'll have fever, and you'll have, of course, a large, enlarged, tender liver. The pruritus comes in because your skin gets dry. You know that the liver detoxifies most medications, right? And prepares ammonia for elimination in the liver. So if it can't do these functions, of course, the uh, ammonia levels will accumulate. Um, that will lead to your um, GI, I mean not GI, neuro uh, symptoms. You'll have, uh, the patient will go uh, cuckoo, they'll get confused, they'll have the irritability, and the um, elevated bilirubin because you, of course your liver synthesizes and get rid, gets rid of bilirubin. So if you can't do that, you'll have uh, jaundice. Um, so your skin will turn yellow, your sclera will turn yellow, your urine will turn dark, um, like dark as in looks like uh, Coca-Cola or Pepsi. Your liver also synthesizes albumin, so if it can't do that job, you'll have decreased albumin levels. And you already know what is the uh, function of albumin in plasma. Blood osmotic pressure. pressure. Okay, it osmotic maintains pressure. osmotic pressure. So if you have decreased osmotic pressure in your plasma, what skin manifestations will you have? Or what fluid imbalance will you edema? So you'll have edema in your abdomen and also in your extremities. Okay. Now, unlike edema, peripheral edema that happened in, uh, in heart failure, how did you form edema in heart failure? Was it the same mechanism as what happened in hepatitis or in liver cirrhosis? No. No, different. So in heart failure, were you in fluid overload or fluid deficit? Overload. You were in fluid overload. So in hepatitis and in liver cirrhosis, are you in fluid overload? No. No, you are not. The opposite is, a, is, is happening here because you have decreased albumin. So your plasma has very low osmotic pressure. So the fluid, instead of staying in your blood, where is the water going? Into the third space, into the interstitial space. So technically, what happens to your blood volume here? Decreases. De decreases. So you have low blood volume. What happens to your blood pressure? Decreases. Decreased. Because the water, although on at first glance, when you look at the patient, they look like they're in fluid overload because they have all this water, all this edema in their abdomen, their arms, and in their legs. However, they're not in fluid overload. They are actually in fluid deficit. They're just simply third spacing, meaning the water becomes useless because they're not being used by the cells, neither are they being used by the blood. You understand? Yeah, because they're in a compartment like they're not being yes, used to right. the circulation. Uh -huh. Yeah, so this is the concept of third spacing. So read the rest here. Here it explains to you why there is a uh, pruritus where there's itching. See here. Um, that's accumulation of bile salts in your skin. I have and a question, the, Professor. Yes. Uh -huh. Is there a big difference between um, like the third spacing and sequestration? Because sequestration is kind of like the um, something hiding or moving into another space, right? It's the same third space. Okay. It's just the mechanism by which how they got there. That's the mm. difference. Yeah. So again, in if you look at heart failure, there is um, accumulation of fluid in the interstitial, interstitial space because of increased hydrostatic pressure, meaning there's just simply 
a lot of congestion in your blood because of fluid overload that the water was pushed out. In hepatitis and in uh, liver cirrhosis, the, the cause was because there's not enough osmotic pressure in the plasma. So as a result, water leaves the, the, the vascular compartment. And then in sequestration that you described, it's a totally different um, mechanism also. Although sequestration is not systemic, unlike in um, in cirrhosis as and in um, in hepatitis, does that make sense? Hello. Mm -hmm. Anna? Yes. Okay. So here, uh, read the explanation on why there is yellowing. Again, this is because of bilirubin. You cannot get rid of it because the liver is not functioning, either temporarily or for forever. Um, in hepatitis, though, if treated, this will all be reversed because the river, I mean, the liver recovers and the liver does uh, regenerate. Uh, you have clay colored stools. Again, if you have darkening of the urine, this is the effect on of, of bile acids on your stool. Um, okay, another function of your liver is it generates clotting factors, correct? So if it is either permanently or temporarily um, non-functional, so that's why you'll have bleeding, uh, disorders. Okay, you have th thrombocytopenia, so you'll have some evidence of bleeding. And we already know the third spacing leading to edema and ascites, depending on where they accumulate. And of course, oliguria, because the patient has less blood volume, less blood pressure, so less blood going to the kidneys, less urine output. Here are your comparison of hepatitis. We will skip G and even F, so we'll only test A, B, C, D, and E. So the question will be on number one is route of transmission, because if that is the, we need to know how it entered, you know, your, your portal of entry, which is the same as your portal of exit, so you can know what the um, prevention is, what precautions you need to take. So let's start with A. How do you get it? Ms. Jemadar? <coughs> Jemadar is not here? Sorry, my mic was off. <laughs> no, oh. I'm here. <laughs> How do I get which one? Hep A. Hep A. Oh, feces are contaminated water. Okay. Now, don't be too exclusive, okay? So, I know this says fecal oral, contaminated water or food. What about if you do oral sex? Oral, yes. what? oral sex. Oral sex. Can you oral get... Sex? Yes, this is fecal oral. Fecal oral meaning, you know, you, you get Ew. feces into your mouth. So is that possible during oral sex? It depends on what you're doing. I mean, what sexual. kind of oral sex is that? That's what, I'm, what do you mean, what kind of oral sex? What, where are you putting in your mouth years. that you're getting feces in your mouth? I mean, if you uh, toss in salad. Between two probably. men, oral sex. Well, oh, uh, same okay. concept as salad is. why do females get frequent UTIs? Bacteria that travels up the urethra. Because of its proximity to the Staying rectum. Close to your ear. Yeah. Right. Okay, go go from there. <laughs> so the same fecal matter that gets in your urethral area can get in your mouth during oral exactly, sex. Exactly, right. Ugh. Okay, so this is what I mean by do not be very exclusive. Okay, you have to explore all possibilities. You mean you should be very exclusive. I mean, sorry. So so this is mostly from whoever to whoever does this to a female? Exactly. So, Not to um, a male. so can you include, is it only, meaning my point is, can you only get hep A from eating contaminated water or food? 
No. 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 It's whatever else you're eating that contains feces. That may contain feces. All right. But to be honest, okay, never mind. I'm not gonna go into this. But do you see my point that it will include oral sex, right? Yeah, but yeah. you gotta be really okay. messy. All right. What you. About, okay, let's go to um Hep B now. How do you get it? Um, blood or bodily fluids. Okay, so um is oral sex okay with this one? No. no. Bodily fluids. It's bodily fluids. Oh. Yes, okay, it is bodily. Yeah, so sex in whatever form, okay? But uh, food? No. 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 Okay. no. <clears throat> Unless you put the body fluids in the food, <laughs> which is just nasty, okay? So let's assume the, you know, you don't have that many pervs that do that. I mean, but weren't you just talking about... Thank you, blood. blood? <laughs> I'm sorry? Didn't you, weren't you just talking about Filipinos eating blood? Like yeah, but we product. cook it. So it cooks up. It cooks out the the hepatitis B. Yeah, even the HIV is dead. <laughs> oh. Okay, well. Wait, but don't yeah, they cook, cook the? Until they cook the guy and all that called blood killing or something like that. I'm sorry. You mean to tell us we need to start boiling people to kill HIV? Oh, well, you kill the person too, so that wouldn't be an option. <laughs> All right, so Hep B and Hep C, any difference between the two? No. No, they're exactly the same. Uh, what about D? Nope. Actually, there is. How do you get D? Same way. You get B. You get D. Look at the um, prevention uh, under the vaccine. Okay, so we have a vaccine for Hep A. We have vaccine for Hep B. No vaccine for Hep C, but at least we have treatment for Hep C. Look at the Hep D. How can you prevent it? By getting so a vaccine. HBV vaccine. Hep, yeah, HBV is the hepatitis B vaccine. So therefore, how do you get D? From... Hepatitis B. Is it possible to get D on its own? No. No. You have to have B, B in order to get, to get D. D. Right. That's what I said. I didn't hear you. Oh. Okay. So, therefore, if you're vaccinized against boy, then you'll never get dog. Dog. All right. Understand? So you mean meaning it's only possible to get hep dog if you have hep boy first. Clear? Gotcha. Yes. All right. So That's let's good. go to uh, any question. All right. Let's go to E. We have let's... to know. The, uh, yes. Um, the intubation period. Uh, no. I mean, um, uh, we just go with the. Um, mode of transmission because the most important here is you prevent it from being passed on and you also prevent it from from getting it in the first place okay, okay so the the rose and uh, the yeah the rose and for the testing here is number one your route of transmission because that will tell you how to prevent it and the source of course that's part of your prevention and then we have the vaccine because that's part of again prevention and it wouldn't hurt to know whether or not there is treatment. So A, E have symptom to symptomatic treatment only because you have to let the course, I mean the, the viral course run its, you know, run, run, because you really can't uh, stop it once you have it. So your treatment will simply be supported. So you support um, hemodynamics, you know, the blood pressure when, when you're having it, you treat the nausea, vomiting, etc. But the whole time you have to prevent transmission um, while they're in under your care. And also, I if have a question, Professor. Yes. For Hep D, you um, do you you have to have Hep B or had Hep D? It's either acute or chronic, yes. Okay. You know, when you, once you have B, when you have boy, you always have it, right? You, yeah. you know that. 
yeah um dog um can be acquired whether you've had it in the past or you're actively having it okay okay so e is similar to a if you compare it right but a is more widespread throughout the world whereas e is more uh, confined to a specific number of countries only meaning a is uh, i mean e uh, echo is not as widespread as alpha but the route is really the same and um, so prevention is the same and treatment is also the same The, the most, most of these signs and symptoms will be repeated when we get to liver cirrhosis. So we will get through liver cirrhosis pretty quickly because we're almost done with the signs and symptoms and they're really going to be almost identical. Hepatic encephalopathy, this is now a com um, complication that will result. Are we recording? Yeah. Yes, okay. So um, encephalopathy is now the um, accumulation of waste products in the brain, particularly ammonia. <clears throat> so this is either going to be manifested during the acute episode or if this is a, in a chronic form of uh, hepatitis, especially if they're non-compliant with the treatment. So what happens is the, the accumulation of ammonia, which is a waste product, damages the brain. And of course, that will lead to uh, acute confusion and changes in mental status. Uh, the patient uh, is the same as having dementia. Okay, so they'll really go um, have cognitive decline. For these paragraphs here, you can either read them or just stick with uh, table 59.1. So they have, uh, they did spe specify the uh, mode of transmission here. Okay, if, so if you um, want to get the specific examples for the exam, they would be found in the paragraph for explanation and examples also. Again, skip G, we're not testing G. Uh, this is what I mean by hepatitis, it's only in specific countries. Um, and as stated here, this is rare in the United States. Whereas uh, hepatitis A is already in uh, the United States. This is not only in uh, Mexico, as uh, most of you probably heard. Management. We already looked at the management under the table 59.1. For diagnostic purposes, of course, we draw blood and we looked at, we look for the virus, identify it. And these are the indicators of the extent of kidney damage. So we look at a, uh, ALT and AST, um, albumin levels, bilirubin, and um, LDH. For uh, medications, I don't have specific questions for the medications because these are involving antivirals. Uh, similar antivirals as used for um, HIV. Um, however, you need to know your um, vaccinations when you take them because this is all again part of prevention. So for let's start with Hep A and B. Who do you um, vaccinate with, uh, of course, vaccine, 
And who do you give immune globulins to? Immunoglobulins are given to someone in active state. And uh, the vaccine is given to children or adults. Uh, no, you have to be more specific than that. So let's say you have the, let's say you're traveling to uh, Mexico, right? You know that the area you're going to has hepatitis everywhere, hep A. So um, if you had, it'll be a different story if you, let's say you have a year before you travel versus you're traveling like this week to, to the place. So do you have time to complete the vaccination? No, so no. you get the immunoglobulin. Okay, that is my question. So therefore, okay. yeah, so you will be have to be given the immune globulin because you need immediate protection. Right. If you have time to complete the series, then that would be, of course, the best. So that's on table 59.3, which is uh, below. So let's finish this part first. Uh, diet during the acute episode are what? Low in fat, high in fruits and vegetables. Uh, why low in fat? Thank you for reading, Miss Dawn. Yes. Um, eating, eating, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Eating a low fat diet decreases indigestion due to the liver's inability to process bile, which emulsifies dietary fat. Okay, so that will also decrease the GI symptoms of nausea vomiting. Uh, small frequent meals will be good. Um, so yeah okay uh, exercise why do we not recommend them to be exerting because you're burning Remember, so much they have fat, fatigue they right yeah they fatigue. have less energy okay so please read that on your own so pretty much there should be a good balance of proper rest and exercise uh, it's not simply resting the liver, but also resting the body. Because they simply will have no energy. And here is your vaccinations. Again, the you, you don't have to do the treatment. This So this column right here with the treatment, your antivirals, that's not tested. It's really just the, um, the vaccination. Oh, here's the vaccine, sorry. So here is... Table 59.3. So who should get vaccinated and how often? So what is the um, the series, like every how many months, the booster? So that will be the question on the test. All right. Okay. We will skip uh, liver transplantation. We'll test this another time. Uh, actually, we did this, didn't we? In exam one or two, under uh, transplant re rejection. No. Did I test uh, liver signs and symptoms of liver rejection? No, just kidding. No, oh, just kidding. rejection. There's bone bone marrow rejection. So okay, I'm very good. Thank you for reminding me. So yeah, so there will be a question on uh, signs and symptoms of kidney. I mean, liver rejection. Oh, also uh, liver. Yeah. So you did. No, no, no. Too late. Yeah, you did it. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. So right here. So these are your signs and symptoms, organ rejection. This is it. It's, it's short. Okay, fever, right upper quad pain, tachycardia, changes in bile, and jaundice. All right, that's it. Gotcha. Ooh. Uh, questions on hepatitis? Here's a summary. Okay, let's proceed with cirrhosis. All right. Uh, question. So the yes, only sir. one we do not need to go over is our G and E. No G, yeah, no G. 
um, and the antivirals, okay, only uh, on vaccination. Again, our focus is prevention, okay, because treatment is mostly symptomatic. And um, of course, C has a treatment and B has treatment and then A, C, I mean A and E are um, uh, symptomatic because you just have to let the virus run its course, just keep the patient alive. Cirrhosis, <clears throat> we have three causes of uh, liver cirrhosis. One is um, from hepatitis. We just finished hepatitis viral, meaning uh, viruses, viral hepatitis can lead to cirrhosis. And then we also have alcoholic cirrhosis or we call it Lennox cirrhosis. And then number three is um, from biliary obstruction. So let's start. What is cirrhosis? Thank you, Miss Janelle. Cirrhosis of the liver can be caused. Cirrhosis of the liver is a chronic disease that causes cell destruction, cell destruction and fibrosis or scarring of hepatic tissues. Functional liver cells die and damaged liver cells to regenerate into nodules of liver cells that are surrounded by fibrous tissue. All right, so although the liver can regenerate, are they all going to regenerate into 100% functional tissue? No. No, Some of, most of them will have fibrous tissue, which are pretty much scar tissue. All right, so this is higher than you think. You probably see in your patients, especially around Woodhall and Bellevue. Those are the concentrated areas. Although we still have cases, um, a lot of cases in Queens, uh, Queens Hospital, but most of our alcoholic population are in the, uh, at least within the areas that we're going to, is um, Woodhall and um, Bellevue. And the rest are all, of course, in, over in Brooklyn. Uh, again, three uh, causes here. We have the most common is alcoholic cirrhosis, and then we have uh, hepatitis, and then finally biliary obstruction. So what happens? So what if you develop cirrhosis? What what's what's the big deal about losing your liver? So we talked about some of them under hepatitis. So when the liver fails, let's remember the functions of the liver. Number one is it synthesizes albumin. So we know albumin is necessary for us to have a normal plasma. Another function is clotting factors. So you will basically have um, bleeding. And also in addition to albumin, that not only maintains your protein levels in the, in the body, but also fluid levels. So that's why we saw edema and ascites under hepatitis. So that will also occur in um, liver cirrhosis. And we know that the liver detoxifies all drugs or any other harmful substances that we ingest, including alcohol. So it will get rid of ammonia. So if there is no more um, uh, liver function, ammonia uh, accumulates. That's when it leads to hepatic encephalopathy. All blood from the GI tract and the lower part of the body before it enters the inferior vena cava, what circulation must it go through? Based on your anatomy. Oral circulation. Okay, it has to go through the liver. So imagine if your liver is fried from alcohol, uh, damaged by hepatitis, or damaged by biliary obstruction. So the result is, have you ever cooked liver? Yes. Uh, who has not seen cooked liver? Me. Who's that? Who are you? Cassandra. Okay, Cassandra. Go out today and buy liver <laughs> and then put it on the grill. Put a little salt on it. Put it on the grill for even just two minutes on each side. You will see, or it doesn't have to be your liver, 
anyway, so it, you've seen meat, right? You've cooked meat, Cassandra? Yes. Okay, so what happens to the to the um, smooth, uh, juicy chicken when you put it on, apply heat to it? It starts to shrivel up. Okay, it shrivels up. The same thing happens to your liver, okay, when you cook it. So when you're al an alcoholic, when you develop hepatitis or biliary obstruction, that's what happens to the liver. So it shrinks, right? It, it becomes stiff and shrinks. So what happens to the blood flow and the blood vessels that are running through it, through which all the blood coming from your GI tract, beginning from your esophagus down to your toes, have to return blood via the portal circulation? What will happen to the blood flow through the liver? Restricted. There's no blood flow. There will be traffic there, correct? Will that result in portal hypertension? Yes. Okay, so once you have that portal hypertension, now you have all this congestion or traffic in the liver. It will enlarge, become tender, and of course, we all already know what happens next. There will be uh, water leaking out of that circulation and that water will now accumulate in the abdomen in your peritoneum resulting in ascites and then you will have also edema in the lower extremities. That's only part of the problem. Another is there will now be um, esophageal varices or even gastric varices. So varices are like varicose veins. So if you get varicose veins in your legs because there's congestion there, there's blood congestion. So it will also form in the vessels in your esophagus because now there's traffic in the liver. So blood coming from the esophagus and the stomach, can they drain via the liver and enter the heart? No. Crickets. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. No. So they will result in dilation of those veins. So the esophageal veins and the gastric veins will all be dilated, become weak, and then form varices or var they become varicose. Are varicose veins normal and strong? Nope. Nope. No. You're afraid to pop them, right? So if you see them, uh, on people or your family members having them, do you um, do you massage those varicose veins? No. No, uh, you're scared to touch them, right? Because they they might pop and cause bleeding. So that's what exactly what will happen if you have esophageal varices. Now these are large veins. When they pop, so let's say you eat something very hot or eat something very sharp. So let's say you swallowed um, thumbtacks. I don't know why you would eat thumbtacks, but something similar, okay? Something really sharp and hard. So let's say you're eating, I don't know, uh, a large amount of hot sauce and um, chicharron, which you did not uh, chew very well, okay? And then you swallowed these sharp, pieces of food, what will they do to those varicose veins inside your esophagus? Pop. They can tear them. Can you bleed? Yes. Yes, massive bleeding. This can cause hemorrhage. So here you have gastric varices. This will cause upper GI bleeding. So you should always watch this. So when a patient comes in with cirrhosis, always assume they have esophageal or gastric varices. So you always watch them for signs and symptoms of GI bleeding, which are again, what? We already discussed this under peptic ulcer disease. Signs and symptoms of bleeding. Well, what you bring red blood? Okay, you coffee either vomit, blood. right, coffee ground emesis or bright red emesis, depending on the amount or how long or how old is the blood that's in the stomach. And of course, if it makes it out through your rectum, the blood will appear. Sorry. 
Black and Terry. Black Very good. Mm -hmm. So the other symptoms are related to the other functions of the liver, which are now non-existent. So you have water retention, ascites already, because your, um, your um, plasma is already low in albumin. You have coagulopathy. Again, your liver is responsible for making clotting factors. You'll have uh, peritonitis, bacterial peritonitis, because that fluid in the peritoneum has nowhere to go. And here is hepatic encephalopathy from your ammonia accumulation in your blood, which will now fry your brain. So the only cure here is what? Um, liver transplant. That's the only cure. If you can't find the liver, then of course you'll have to treat this symptomatically. Symptomatic treatment meaning all those complications that we talked about, you're going to have to manage them. So you prevent bleeding or manage bleeding if they have uh, bleeding from the esophageal varices. You uh, manage the fluid and electrolyte imbalances that occur, manage ascites and the peripheral edema, uh, or if they develop encephalopathy or bacterial peritonitis and also the portal hypertension itself. Okay, so these will be all our treatments. Because again, how do you cure cirrhosis? Liver transplant only. Liver transplant. Right, because we can't have that for everybody. Then you'll have to manage these chronic problems, which are all life-threatening. All right, so we already did this alcohol. I said this is lenox cirrhosis. We have here biliary obstruction, or that's called cholangitis. And then we have um, hepatitis, okay, or post-necrotic um, cirrhosis, meaning resulting from uh, hepatitis or the, the viral hepatitis uh, causes. Uh, these are your general signs and symptoms. We already did this. These, oh, except for the hepatorenal syndrome. Okay, so this one, it's a syndrome. So do we know exactly what causes a syndrome? No, no, no. no. okay, so because it's a series of um, signs and symptoms that make up, yeah, right, that make up the condition. So this is one of the complications also that will arise from cirrhosis, the patient will have hepatorenal syndrome, or simply put, this is pre-renal uh, kidney injury. So here is your uh, ascites. So we said that um, uh, because of your low albumin, um, that will cause fluids to come out of the plasma and then settle in either the abdomen or in your peripheral extremities. So this is accumulation of fluid and this will only get worse if you have, uh, once you reach 500 ml or more of that fluid, that will now cause symptoms such as shortness of breath, uh, abdominal pain, and of course this is heavy, okay? This, this is heavy to um, carry around. So the patient typically becomes bed bound because of it. And the only um, recourse is to have your abdomen drained. So we call that procedure what again? To tap the abdomen to drain ascites? Paracinium synthesis. Paracentesis, okay. P A R A and then C E N T E S I S. Paracentesis. So we'll do that every few months because, again, is there a cure for cirrhosis? No. 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 So you, this is what I mean by the patient will have to manage this symptomatically. So every few months, the patient will have to go either to their doctor or most of the time the ER have this drained. Here is the 
portal hypertension and varices, which we discussed. This can uh, leads to the uh, formation of varicose veins in the esophagus and the stomach, which are high risk for bleeding. If you have these varicose veins there, you will also have hemorrhoids. Because again, these are all the blood that drains from beginning from your esophagus down to your toes. All that blood has to return to the heart via the portal circulation, which again has traffic. So these, all these will form. And hepatic encephalopathy, these are your signs. The flapping tremor mentioned here in, uh, what is this figure? Figure 59.3. Uh, flapping tremor is your number one sign of hepatic encephalopathy, along with the mental status changes. You elicit flapping tremor by asking the patient to hold their arms up in the air and they cannot hold it steady. The, the neurons, the, the nerves um, going to the uh, arms are very unstable <clears throat> and they result in the tremor. We call that asterixis. A-S-T-E-R-E-X-I-S. -E -E asterixis. <coughs> Um, by the way, the ascites here, as you can see, illustrated here, will there be one particular area that will hold all that water? Because of the presence of your GI organs? Uh, what yeah. I'm trying to ask is, if, is there one particular area you can you know, put the needle and then, you know, it will drain everything? No. No. No, no. no because it's impossible because you have pockets here everywhere. Mm -hmm. So let's say the doctor taps. Before they tap it, though, they have to do, to order a ultrasound. The ultrasound tech has to locate where is the maximum amount of fluid accumulating. That way they maximize the procedure. So if they decide, oh, it's right here. So the ultrasound tech will mark the area with a um, Sharpie and then the doctor comes in, they will insert the needle there and then drain it. During the procedure though, they will ask the patient to turn from side to side. That way we can drain some of these hopefully and then put them back into that pocket where the needle is uh, inserted. And that's how we drain. Uh, coagulopathy, the patient can develop DIC, although this is not very common unlike esophageal varices, but DIC is possible in, um, um, in cirrhosis. Oh, here's the asterixis. Oh, I spelled it wrong. It's A-S-T-E-R-I-X-I-S. So that is the flapping tremors. Here's your hepatorenal syndrome and the peritonitis. Again, because of the, the fluid has nowhere to go, it's a high risk for peritonitis. That's why they have to be drained periodically. Management now. So this is not um, hepatitis. This is now damage to the liver. This is chronic. Again, the only cure is a transplant. Diagnosis, of course, will consist of a CAT scan and an ultrasound. We visualize the liver <clears throat> as well as look for ascites in the abdomen. If it's caused by biliary obstruction, then an ERCP will be done. ERCP is like an endoscopy. However, unlike uh, an EGD, wherein the scope stops at the duodenum, this uh, procedure goes further. The scope will be inserted up into the um, common bile duct. Okay, so this 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 uh, scope is smaller and has the ability to go and observe not only the the um, gallbladder, 
but also the pancreas. Uh, this is paracentesis. Um, we typically don't use a uh, syringe. I mean, the syringe won't take so many. So instead, they'll use a needle to insert it, but then it will be attached to a drain to uh, remove a, a large amount of fluid. All of these, as you can see, will be elevated. On the exam, by the way, don't be confused because um, all these are liver functions, uh, liver enzymes, sorry. These are liver enzymes, which of course will be elevated, uh, including your bilirubin, but look at albumin is decreased, okay? And bleeding time, again, your liver is responsible for clotting factors. So your bleeding times, which is your PT, PTT are prolonged. Platelets will be low. So please don't forget or don't get these confused on the exam. <clears throat> we mentioned ascites. So how do we manage ascites? So rather than, well, a TIPS procedure is actually reserved for patients who have, number one, either they have um, too frequent ascites accumulation, meaning it's no longer practical to keep tapping them like every week. So what they'll do is perform a tips. However, this is not a, this is only a last resort procedure because what happens is if you put this shunt in, uh, let me show you a um, YouTube video. Because although the liver in cirrhosis, most of the liver is already gone, um, it's not 100% gone. There are still parts of the liver. Remember, the liver regenerates, right? They have, uh, they form, re regenerate in nodules and then surrounded by fibrous tissue, but they are still liver tissue. So as long as, what is this? Tips. Uh, um, this, let's try this, this one. Animation. Can you see the YouTube animation? Yes. Okay. This is for drainage, correct? I'm sorry? This is for drainage, correct? No, this is uh, tips. Again, um, people who have frequent ascites, meaning if, if it's getting ridiculous that you're, you're um, having to tap them almost every week, they will have to resort to this procedure. Again, they don't do this tips procedure as a first option, meaning it has to be a, a last resort. Okay, if you, if you can't manage the portal hypertension and the ascites, um, you'll have to resort this uh, to this TIPS procedure. Again, this is not a first option because it has very um, drastic um, consequences though. Okay, so let's watch how it is and um, the possible consequences that can result from the procedure.
Okay, so now you have a um, a tips. So this is a shunt uh, bypassing the liver. So as mentioned in the earlier part of the video, if the patient has severe uncontrolled portal, um, portal hypertension and they've had recurrent variceal bleeding, uh, which can be life-threatening, as well as the, um, the ascites that is non-stop now, because they usually go together um, as a consequence if the, uh, the, the cirrhosis is advanced. So they'll bypass the entire uh, portal circulation using this shunt. Now the consequence is the blood, does it go through, go in the liver tissue? coming from the from the um, stomach, from the esophagus, and also from the lower extremities, as they return to the heart, are they really going through liver tissue? No. No. Technically, yes. Technically, they're going through the liver, but they're not going into the liver circulation. They're going through the shunt because you bypass the whole liver here. So the blood that is dirty, carrying ammonia, waste products from the lower extremities, the oxygenated, the oxygenated blood, when they pass through here, are they being cleaned by the liver? No. Yes or no? No. Not anymore because they are going through the shunt they are absolutely bypassing the liver now. So although that will relieve the esophageal varices, you know, will there still be esophageal varices? Is blood can now freely drain back to the um, uh, inferior vena cava? Yeah. Will you still have varicose veins here forming in the stomach or the esophagus? No. No more. So the, the, the drainage is now increased, so that will relieve the bleeding. So that's one good thing about this. You will no longer have, um, uh, what's this, uh, esophageal varices. So no more GI bleeding. And also the edema will be also less in the um, peripheral, um, in the peripheral areas, no more leg edema. And the ascites will also decrease because there is no more congestion. Blood is freely going back to the to the heart. There is no more um, traffic in the in the liver. However, again, the question is: Is the blood still being detoxified by the liver as a result? No. Not anymore. So the consequence here is: What will happen to your ammonia levels after this procedure? Increase. increase. It will actually increase. It will not do anything about the encephalopathy, but at least this will save the patient from esophageal variceal bleeding. Okay, so that's, uh, there are some good things here, but again, that's one of the consequences of this procedure. Will these patients be permanently on like uh, lactulose? Exactly. So after the TIPS procedure, the doctor, in fact, may have to uh, increase the um, lactulose doses. The daily lactulose doses may have to be increased after a TIPS procedure. But at least the blood pressure is better. You have uh, no more variceal bleeding. The ascites will be less. Um, but again, the, the consequence there is the encephalopathy will continue or even get worse after the procedure. So what's the maintenance to the, um, after the surgery to this show? Like okay, we'll, we'll get to the, right, we'll get to the um, uh, drug therapy shortly. So uh, again, all these management here are all related to the um, complications that result from uh, cirrhosis. So here is uh, portal hypertension. This can lead to bleeding. So if they do have bleeding in the esophageal uh, varices, they will put this big tube. This is like a Foley catheter. I don't know if we have a... Here's a picture. Okay. 
Look at the size of this tube. So they will put this in your nose, down your throat, and inflate the balloon in order to stop. Because remember, the, the varicose veins are inside here, the esophagus. So if you're having major bleeding, an acute episode of bleeding, they will inflate this, insert this balloon, uh, this catheter, and inflate this balloon. This will, the balloon will put pressure on the, um, on the bleeding esophageal varices, stop it from bleeding until uh, blood clots naturally, and then it, it stops the bleeding. But look at the size of this. It, this is not a small tube. This is probably the size of, you see those markers we use in class? That's the diameter of this of this uh, tube. Okay, this is a very large long tube, a uh, purpose of which is of course to stop the bleeding. Um, of course, the patient will have to be watched because this is a very big um, tube. It may cause here's a safety alert. It can cause um, not only mucosal irritations because of the size but it can also cause uh, airway obstruction or even aspiration because the patient can't swallow with that big of a tube in there. So they can't protect their airway. Uh, encephalopathy will be given by, uh, I mean, managed with lactulose. Now, there's no set number of lactulose doses here. You've probably given lactulose as a laxative, right? Um, yeah. It's kind of sort of the same um, purpose that we're giving it because the only way you eliminate ammonia is through your GI tract. And because there is low blood pressure here, so there will be low peristalsis, plus you have ascites, so all of these will result in constipation, right? So in order to continue eliminating ammonia, you have to keep the a stool coming. So the lactulose will be given, um, the dose will depend on how many BMs the patient gets. So you'll give lactulose typically every four hours until the patient has about two to three soft bowel movements a day. If they don't have a bowel movement, you continue giving the lactulose until they do. All right, um, here's um, small frequent <clears throat> meals. Um, the, the, um, the amount of protein here has to be controlled because what's the source of ammonia here? How do you get ammonia? From protein, protein. intake. Protein. Right, oh. right. uh-huh. So ammonia is a byproduct of protein metabolism, yeah. meaning the more protein you give somebody, the blank your ammonia levels. Higher. The higher your ammonia levels. So the patient may be have to be controlled, uh, we may have to control their protein levels based on their ammonia levels. However, in hepatitis, the patient needs to heal, right? And without protein, can you heal without protein? No. No. So we don't necessarily restrict protein. We just need to control it. The basis of your protein intake, the doctor decides it based on your ammonia level. So the higher the ammonia level, then the less the protein intake will be uh, in the diet. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the doctor has to play around with the protein uh, levels in the diet. He'll have to make a decision based on the ammonia levels. And we do the same with the lactulose. So the higher the ammonia level, the more lactulose doses you'll be giving. And the basis of that, of course, is the, uh, is the bowel movement. There has to be two, at least two uh, soft stools a day. Until they get that, you keep giving the lactulose. Okay, so the doctor won't dictate uh, two or three only. You give lactulose until you get that BM um, output. Okay. Um, 
we already said that the only cure for cirrhosis is the uh, liver transplant. Um, and then that's it for uh, cirrhosis. Uh, like I said, it's very similar to hepatitis. This one though, it, meaning if the patient with hepatitis develops cirrhosis, then in addition to the uh, management of your um, cirrhosis is you also manage the hepatitis, which is causing the cirrhosis. Any question? <clears throat> no. All right, very good children. Now for next week, so we have your exam three. When do you want your exam a uh, quiz seven again? You said Monday, correct? Monday, Monday yeah. March 30 at 9 a.m. So that's all the time we're meeting. I'm simply opening the exam at 9, closes at 9.15, and then that's it. When do you want your quiz 8? I'm doing the same thing. I guess the same time the next same. Monday? The following Monday? Another Monday. That would be April 6th. Is that 6? Which topics will be on exam 8? The ones we go over next Friday? Oh, exam, uh, the same I mean, thing. quiz eight, sorry, quiz eight. Uh, the quiz for quiz seven on Monday. Yeah, but the topics for quiz eight, when will we be going over those topics? Uh, actually, we're done with the semester. Yeah. The oh. last, oh, yeah, okay. this is the last topic, cirrhosis. So oh. your quiz eight will be, um, do you want it to start from anemia? Okay, sure. Yeah, okay, anemia and then and a little bit. Last, this, this is the last Yeah, lesson done with the semester. lessons. Wow. It's all exams from here on, yeah. That's what, that's what we're saying. Anemia, polycythemia. So, uh, yeah, sickle cell. Can you just and then, list the topics for, for quiz seven and quiz eight before we leave? Okay, so all right, so let's, uh, children, quiz seven. <laughs> <laughs> is TBI. You said, what, say that again. Okay. TBI, quiz, quiz seven. TBI. Okay, children, listen. Quiz seven is TBI, Parkinson's, and MS. Okay. Quiz eight are anemias. So that will cover um, sickle cell as well and um, polycythemia and then the liver, which is hepatitis and uh, cirrhosis. That's quiz eight. Mm, gotcha. <clears throat> so quiz eight topics are the same as in exam four, technically. Professor? Yes? For quiz seven, you said ALS? <clears throat> um, I mean, you can disregard ALS. I mean, I only have two questions on exam three on ALS. <coughs> so I probably won't waste that question on the on the quiz. Quiz. <laughs> and then to just um, quiz a sickle cell polycythemia. Um, no, all the anemias. Yep. Mm -hmm. oh, all the anemias. And, yeah, and then liver. And then the liver. Mm -hmm. So we just logging on at 9 a.m. Yes. So uh, Monday, March 30, uh, quiz 7, 9 a.m. to 9.15 a.m. Okay. Easiest test you've ever taken. Uh, <laughs> as usual. Yep. So exam a quiz eight will be April six. <coughs> um, no. <coughs> oh, Corona. <coughs> Do you have any uh, <laughs> problems with quiz eight on April six? Yep. No problem. No. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, good, Do you yeah. feel somewhat better with um? No, it's not really. 
a crazy amount of topics, right? Can you put the Not blueprint really. up for example? I didn't give it to you yet. Mm, no. no, I don't okay. think so. Let me check. Only exam three. We need exam four. No, only exam three. 